If you haven't already, please take a second to subscribe to the channel, and also don't forget to click on the notification bell, so you'll be up to date on all videos released from the Everything Network. The Los Angeles crime family, also known as the LA Mafia, is an Italian-American organized crime syndicate based in Los Angeles, California, as part of the American Mafia. Since its inception in the early 1900s, it has spread throughout Southern California. Like most Mafia families in the United States, the LA crime family gained power bootlegging during the Prohibition era. The LA family reached its peak in the 1940s and early 1950s under Jack Dragna, who was on the commission, although the LA family was never bigger than the New Yorker Chicago families. Since his death the crime family has been on a gradual decline, with the Chicago outfit representing them on the commission. In the late 1970s, Afradiano became the second member in American Mafia history to testify against the Mafia. In 1981 a biography of Fradiano was published, The Last Mafioso by Ava Demris, which along with his court testimonies, is the source for a lot of information on the history of the family. Since the 1980s, the Racketeer-Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act became a highly effective law in convicting mobsters and shrinking the American Mafia. Like all families in the United States, the LA Mafia only holds a fraction of its former power. The current family is small compared to other families and is involved in fraud, extortion, loan sharking, illegal gambling, drug trafficking, and legitimate businesses. Although not having to share power with other mafia families like New York's five families, never having a strong Italian-American population in the region leaves the family to contend with the many street gangs in the gang capital of America. The Los Angeles crime family is the last mafia family left in the state of California. The early years of organized crime in California were marked by the division of various Italian street gangs, such as the Black Hand organizations in the early 20th century. The most prominent of these was the Matranga crime family, a gang ran by relatives of Charles Matranga, founder of the New Orleans crime family. Their legitimate business was in fruit vending. Otherwise they used threats, violence, arson and extortion to control the plaza area, which was the heart of the Italian-American community of Los Angeles at the time. Its first leader was Orsario Sam Matranga who started leading the family in 1905. Sam's relatives Salvador Matranga, Pietro Peter Matranga, and Antonio Tony Matranga were other members of the gang. Joseph Cuccia was a well-respected criminal amongst the underworld who served as a translator in court for Italians who didn't speak English. This made him a well-liked man in the Italian community. When prominent Black Hand leader Joseph Ardizan was involved in a dispute with George Misano, a member of the Matranga gang, they both went to Cuccia to mediate the dispute. Cuccia was a relative of Ardizan and member of his crime family. He ruled in Ardizan's favor, causing the Matrangas to threaten harm on Cuccia. In response, Ardizan shot and killed Misano on July 2, 1906. Ardizan then fled authorities and was a wanted fugitive. With Ardizan gone, the Matrangas fulfilled their promise of revenge. On September 25, 1906, Cuccia was shot and killed, allegedly by Tony Matranga. With both Ardizan and Cuccia gone, the Matrangas were the dominant force in Los Angeles. However, their power was limited to within the plaza community. To change this they cooperated with the police. Giving up information on their enemies and receiving immunity for most of their crimes, the Matrangas were able to expand their power and influence. Ardizan returned to Los Angeles in 1914 and resumed his feud with the Matranga family. Sam and his successor Pietro Peter Matranga were both murdered within 33 days of each other in 1917. Mike Marino, aka Mike Rizzo, an Ardizan ally was responsible for the murders. Well their next leader, cousin Tony Bicola was able to get revenge and kill Marino in 1919, many years of violence ruined the Matranga family. It was becoming clear that Ardizan's faction was winning the war. With the rise of bootleggers in the 1920s, the Matranga's power declined and was eliminated with Bicola's disappearance in 1930. Albert Marco seized control of Los Angeles in the 1920s, not by working with a local mafia, but with the City Hall Gang, a political machine in Los Angeles run by Ken Kane Parrott and Charles H. Crawford. This transformed Marco into the Vice Lord of Los Angeles, earning $500,000 from bordello prostitution alone. With Crawford and Parrott controlling City Hall and the local press, the City Hall gang was able to operate bootlegging, prostitution, and illegal gambling rackets in the shadows, with little law enforcement scrutiny. This all changed when Marco was convicted of assault with a deadly weapon in 1928, and the City Hall gang broke down after a reform movement swept LA in the late 1920s, since then a host of mobsters fought to take control of liquor operations that Marco and the City Hall gang previously dominated. In 1928 August Palumbo was the seventh bootleggers killed in a six-week period. 
Palumbo was Marco's lieutenant and was killed for refusing to merge his criminal operations with Rosario Desimond. Desimond's lieutenant Dominic de Ciala, aka Dominic de Soto, was acquitted of the murder and took control of Palumbo's liquor operations. When he tried to challenge higher powers by moving into syndicated gambling rackets, he was murdered in 1931. Joseph Ardizan returned to California in 1914 and was acquitted of murdering Misano in 1915 due to lack of evidence and no witnesses willing to testify. He quickly returned to power and took control of rackets in Los Angeles. Ardizan teamed up with Jack Dragna and they worked closely together for over 10 years. During Prohibition the two were successful in running bootlegging operations in Southern California as well as gambling and extortion. By the end of the 1920s he was rapidly expanding his power and influence. Under Ardizan's tenure, organized crime began consolidating under his banner as he dominated criminal activities in L.A. In the late 1920s, Jack Dragna and Johnny Roselli constantly battled Charlie Crawford for control of the lucrative bootlegging rackets. With the deaths of Bicola and Diciala in 1930 and 1931, respectively, Ardizan, who was the prime suspect in both murders, was the undisputed leader of crime in L.A. He set up the Italian Protective League, with Dragna as its president, Ardizan as its vice president, and California State Senator Joseph Pedrotti as its chairman. The organization had some political and social motives, but mostly served as a strong arm muscle for the crime family. His reign as boss was short-lived when he mysteriously disappeared in 1931. Ardizan was in conflict with the Mafia's National Crime Syndicate on the East Coast, leading to Ardizan's elimination. Jack Dragna took control of the family after Ardizan's death in 1931 and made peace with the National Syndicate. In addition, his brother Tom Dragna was made his consigliere, while his nephew Louis Dragna became a made man in 1947. Dragna was the most successful boss the LA family ever had. Although he wasn't able to infiltrate many of the labor unions in the entertainment industry, he involved the Los Angeles family in the entertainment business and brought the LA Mafia onto the national stage, he was honored with a place on the commission, the only boss west of Chicago to hold a spot on the council. When Prohibition ended in 1933, Dragna operated a massive loan shark and illegal gambling business. Along with close supporter John Roseley, Dragna's mafia family ended local gang wars by driving older gambling syndicate headed by Guy McAfee and Milton Farmer Page out of business. Dragna and Roseley worked with Joe Shaw, the brother of Mayor Frank Shaw, to muscle out LA bookies, many of whom fled to Las Vegas. By 1937, Dragna controlled gambling in Los Angeles. For independent bookmakers, Dragna would use extortion to collect money from their operations. While most mobsters simply threatened harm on a business for not paying tribute to their organization, protection racket, Dragna's family came up with a more sophisticated course of action. Dragna would send in men to threaten businesses, then the owners would pay him for protection, unaware that these were Dragna's own men. He wasn't, however, able to control 100% of independent gambling rackets. Along with Dragna avoiding the spotlight and public life, he often was given the reputation as a weak ruler. According to Mickey Cohen, Dragna was very powerful and very well respected, but did not put things together the way the East Coast bosses preferred. Although there was not a big pool of Italians to recruit on the West Coast like back East, the LA family worked around this by accepting members from across the country, such as Johnny Roseli from Chicago, Nick Licata from Detroit, and Aladdin Afradiano and Dominic Brooklier from Cleveland. Armed with top hitman Frank Bompensiero and Jimmy Frediano, who committed over 30 murders on the orders of their superiors. Dragna muscled his way into controlling territory stretching throughout California and southern Nevada. The Dragna family also had connections within the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, who were more corrupt than the city police. Although not having a big hand in labor union rackets, the Dragna crime family did infiltrate some unions in the laundromat and dress importing business. When Charles Luciano sent Bugsy Siegel from New York City to Los Angeles to take control of their interests on the West Coast, including Las Vegas, he formed an uneasy partnership with Jack Dragna. Siegel was able to get independent bookies to pay tribute to Dragna's already flourishing gambling business. Aside from this however, Dragna resented Siegel's power to infiltrate unions in the movie industry. Siegel made millions extorting movie production companies and only had to pay Dragna a tribute for working on his territory. With New York on Siegel's side there was little Dragna could do to take control of the commission's grip of the city. The main reason Siegel came to California was to organize a horse racing wire service on the west coast for the National Syndicate, which Siegel and Dragna worked closely together on setting up. Dragna and Siegel tried many methods to take over Continental Press Service, the main wire service at the time. Attempts to buy out the company and to strong-arm its owners didn't work, so they set up their own company called Transamerica. 
the Chicago outfit eventually took over rival Continental Racing Services and gave the entire percentage of the racing wire on the West Coast to Dragna, enraging Siegel. Once Bugsy Siegel ran out of favor with New York, he was ordered to be killed. Although his murder officially remains unsolved, one theory is that Dragna's men were given the order to kill him. Siegel's chief lieutenant Mickey Cohen took charge of his gambling and loan shark operations in Los Angeles County and eventually became Dragna's next target. Dragna first began recruiting Cohen's Italian men such as Dominic Brooklier to his family and killing his other men, such as David Ogle, Frank Nicoli, Nettie Herbert, and Herman Hookier Othman. However, through sheer luck Cohen survived many attempts on his life. In 1951 Cohen was imprisoned for tax evasion and the LA family moved in on his gambling business. The number of high-profile murders and gangsters moving into the West Coast combined with a recall of Mayor Frank L. Shaw because of corruption charges related to organized crime caused law enforcement to stop accommodating the mafia. In the late 1930s, California Attorney General Earl Warren took command of a tough assault on Dragna's empire, most notably shutting down the gambling ships run by Anthony Cornero. On February 14, 1950, the California Commission on Organized Crime singled out Dragna as the head of a crime syndicate that controlled crime in Southern California. Soon after several of his family members were arrested for the bombing of Mickey Cohen's home. Dragna fled the state and was wanted for questioning. He later surrendered and was questioned in the Kefauver hearings, along with Ray and Bampensiero, but denied all accusations against him. Dragna's family remained strong throughout the early 1950s. While other mafia families in the country were prospering in the 1950s, the LA family was beginning its decline. When William H. Parker became chief of police for the Los Angeles Police Department in 1950, the police started cracking down on organized crime instead of assisting it. The weakened Los Angeles family lost ground to the Chicago outfit and New York families. Due to over 50 unsolved gangland killings in the first half of the century, the LAPD formed a special task force to deal with the problem. The Gangster Squad. These group of men harassed the mafia throughout the 1950s. Frank Bompensiero and Frediano started serving prison sentences in 1953 and 1954, respectively. In 1956 Jack Dragna died of a heart attack, and a vote was made by the senior members of the family to elect its new boss. Johnny Roselli would have been a great choice, but he was a member of the Chicago outfit. Lawyer-turned-gangster Frank De Simone was victorious. A disappointed Roseli, who felt the Desimon rigged the election and wanted Tom Dragna to get it transferred back to the Chicago outfit. Frediano did the same after his release from prison in 1960. With Jack Dragna gone and his brother Tom Dragna retiring a year after his death, the crime family slipped out of control. It quickly became apparent that Frank de Simone was an incompetent boss. According to an unidentified informant, he raped the wife of former underboss Girolamo Momo Adamo, which caused Adamo to shoot his wife, who survived, and kill himself. This meant the top three men from Dragna's era, the boss, underboss, and consigliere, were all inactive in Los Angeles almost immediately after de Simone took charge. By 1965, it was estimated that the number of members of the LA family living in Los Angeles dwindled to 30, while the family actually had a strong presence in San Diego. In the 1960s, Bonanno crime family boss Joseph Bonanno plotted to have de Simone killed for failing to exploit the criminal opportunities in Los Angeles. The plan was thwarted, but caused to become very paranoid, never leaving his house at night. De Simone's unsuccessful reign concluded with his death in 1967, after 11 years in power. De Simone's third underboss Nick Licata succeeded him. Licata had strong ties with mafia families in the Midwest and South and maintained contact with the mob in Las Vegas. By then, law enforcement knew much about mob activities in Los Angeles, which was helped by top hitman Frank Bompensiero becoming an undercover informant in 1967. In 1963 Joe Valachi ousted the Mafia as a secret criminal society, aiding in law enforcement's attacks on organized crime, and fingered Licata as a high-ranking mobster in Los Angeles. A bright spot during the period was that Louis Tom Dragna's company Roberta Dress Manufacturing was turning into a $10 million a year business. This was possible because in the 1950s, Jack Dragna flew labor union expert Johnny Dio in from New York City to teach Louis how to manipulate labor unions in the garment district. Licata had high hopes of restoring the declining family, but with the police and FBI constantly monitoring his family, Licata wasn't able to do much of a better job than De Simone. On July 9, 1969, Licata was taken into custody after refusing to answer questions at a federal grand jury session about the Los Angeles crime syndicate structure. He was held in contempt of court for refusing to testify after being given immunity from prosecution and eventually served six months in prison. A pair of indictments in the mid-1970s threatened to put most of the working family in prison. 
In March 1973, seven men were arrested for running a rig gambling operation in Los Angeles that brought in up to $250,000 a month. Their trial was delayed when the key informant and witness, former mafia associate John Dubcek, was shot and killed in Las Vegas. Although this scared other informants from testifying, they still were convicted and given light sentences. Four months later another 12 men were indicted for conspiracy, racketeering and extortion against bookmakers, loan sharks, and pornographers. Licata's underboss Joseph DiPolito had a large influence in San Bernardino and the Inland Empire in both legitimate and criminal enterprises. He was seen as Licata's successor but died unexpectedly of a heart attack in January 1974 at the age of 59. On October 19, 1974, after a long battle with illnesses, Nick Licata died at age 77. Licata's successor, Dominic Brooklier, was initially able to stabilize the family's businesses but later endured considerable damage done by FBI informants. Brooklier was able to make a lot of money in pornography, extortion, and drugs, but wasn't able to take back control of the independent bookmaking rackets in Los Angeles. The last mafioso described several instances during the time when the family would shake down people in the porno industry. These men would then pay a fee to their mafia backers, usually on the East Coast, to set things straight. Once they paid, the mafia backers would secretly split the money with the LA family. Brooklier also ordered the death of Frank Bompensiero for his growing criticism of the family and later finding evidence that he was cooperating with the FBI. When Brooklier was sentenced to a short prison stint along with his underboss Amuel Siartino in 1975, Aladina Frediano transferred back to the LA family and was named acting boss. Frediano took this position to heart, traveling across the country making connections and deals. Frediano's goal was to bring back the ailing family's stature and reputation amongst the mafia. Since Jack Dragna's death, Los Angeles was starting to be seen as an open city where any family could do business, but Frediano hoped that by restoring the ailing family, he'd be a candidate to officially run the family, even when Brooklier was released. However, Brooklier quickly took back control of the family after his release, and Frediano was left back to being a low-level soldier. The fall came when Aladina Frediano became the second mobster to turn state's evidence and testify against the mafia in court. He made this decision upon learning from the FBI that Dominic Brooklier ordered his death. Brooklier, who didn't trust Frediano, ordered the hit because Frediano was presenting himself as boss of the family and felt that he was trying to usurp him. Frediano testified against mobsters not only in Los Angeles but across the country. Although the Justice Department thought it finally crippled the mafia in Los Angeles, a federal judge gave Brooklier, Samuel Ciartino, Michael Rizzatello, Louis Tom Dragna, and Jack Lowe Cicero, light sentences ranging from two to five years in 1981 for racketeering and extortion. Brooklier still ran the family from his prison cell until he died of a heart attack in 1984. With Brooklier's imprisonment, Peter Milano quickly stepped up and began running the family from 1981 to 2012. Peter Milano was officially made boss of the Los Angeles crime family with Brooklier's death in 1984. He made his brother Carmen Milano his underboss. Since Milano's reign, the family was heavily involved in narcotics, pornography, gambling and loan sharking. Twenty reputed organized crime figures were arrested in 1984 in what law enforcement officials said was a bid to take over a $1 million a week bookmaking operation in Los Angeles. Neither of the Milano brothers, nor six of the others originally arrested, were charged due to lack of evidence. When Peter Milano became boss, he rejuvenated the depleted family by inducting new members such as Stephen Steve the Whale Sino, singer Charles Bobby Milano Casey, Luigi Luigi Fuso Jr. and Shylock brothers Lawrence and Anthony, the animal fiado into the family. Mobster turned informant Kenny Gallo credited the brothers with helping Pete Milano revamp the LA family. With a beefed up family, Milano succeeded in having nearly every bookie in Los Angeles pay a mob tax to the LA family. Robert Puggy's Zajic gave Anthony Fiato a $1 million loan which was used to finance a huge loan shark operation. The LA family became the dominate loan shark operators in the area. The family's influence stretched all the way to Las Vegas, where the family had long-standing ties to what the mafia considered an open city, where any family could work in. The entire hierarchy of the family including the Milano brothers, Captains Michael Rizzatello, Jimmy Casey, and Luigi Gilfuso, along with many other mobsters, were arrested on various charges in the late 1980s, due largely to information and recordings collected by the Fiato brothers. These charges to so many members permanently crippled the family and put the family on the brink of extinction. Rizzatello, who was acquitted of his original charges at trial, was sentenced to 33 years in prison in 1989 for attempted murder, where he would die in 2005, the Milano brothers plead guilty to lesser charges, Peter received a six-year prison sentence, and Carmen received six months. 
Almost every member of the family charge pleaded guilty to receive lesser sentences, and the FBI considered the mafia finished in Los Angeles. However, since Peter Milano's paroled release in 1991, he took back control of the Weekend family. The Los Angeles family since made moves into Las Vegas with the Buffalo crime family. The family made headlines again with the murder of Chicago outfit associate Herbert Fat Herbie Blitstein by Buffalo and Los Angeles family members in 1997. Blitstein had a lucrative loan shark and auto insurance fraud business the two families moved in to take over. This caused a great deal of scrutiny from the FBI on both families. Members like Stephen Sino and Alfred Moriello were convicted on related charges along with other associates who cooperated with officials to receive a reduced sentence, putting the LA crime family on its last leg. By the 1990s the LA family was estimated to have 20 official members. Much of the crime family's activities has become unknown since the Las Vegas indictments. Law enforcement has moved its attention towards other gangs like the Russians and Triads, who are more sinister and far more prevalent and widespread. Peter Milano was still believed to be the official boss of the Los Angeles crime family. But his involvement in crime along with other members has been greatly reduced since the 1980s. Some members like Rocco Zangari and Russell Masetta have moved out of the state and left the family altogether. Other members like Carmen Milano and Jimmy Casey have died of old age and no younger people have replaced them. Los Angeles doesn't have a high concentration of Italians like the East Coast to support them, so recruiting new members is challenging. With Southern California's many racial groups, the mob faces an uphill battle to challenge the many street gangs in the area over criminal rackets. Law enforcement also considers East Coast Mafia members moving to California as a threat. Benjamin Bugsy Siegel was a Jewish-American mobster. He was known as one of the most infamous and feared gangsters of his day. Described as handsome and charismatic, he became one of the first front-page celebrity gangsters. He was also a driving force behind the development of the Las Vegas Strip. He was not only influential within the Jewish mob, but, like his friend and fellow gangster Meyer Lansky, he also held significant influence within the Italian-American Mafia and the largely Italian-Jewish National Crime Syndicate. Siegel was also one of the founders and leaders of Murder Incorporated and also a bootlegger during Prohibition. As a boy, he dropped out of school and joined a gang on Lafayette Street on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. He committed mainly thefts until he met crime figure, Mo Sedway. With Sedway, Siegel developed a protection racket where push cart merchants were forced to pay him a dollar or he would incinerate their merchandise. He had a criminal record that included armed robbery and murder, dating back to his teenage years. During adolescence, Benny befriended another Irish mobster by the name of Meyer Lansky, together they formed a small gang whose activities expanded to gambling and car theft. Lansky, who had already had a run-in with Lucky Luciano, saw a need for the Jewish boys of his Brooklyn neighborhood to organize themselves in the same manner as the Italians and Irish. The first person he recruited for his gang was Benny Siegel. Benny soon became involved in bootlegging within several major East Coast cities. He also worked as the mob's hitman, whom Lansky would hire out to other crime families. Together they formed the Bugs and Meyer gang. The group handled contracts for the various bootleg gangs operating in New York and New Jersey, doing so almost a decade before Murder Incorporated was formed. The gang kept themselves busy hijacking the booze cargoes of rival mobsters. The Bugs and Meyer gang was known to be responsible for the killing and removal of several rival mob figures during their time. Siegel's gangmates included such mob figures such as Abner's Willman, Louis Buckhalter, and a relative of Meyer Lansky, Jake Stalker. Another member of the Bugs and Meyer gang recalled to Lansky biographers that Siegel was fearless and saved his friend's life on many different occasions when the gang started to get into bootlegging. A fellow mobster was recorded saying that Benny never hesitated when danger threatened. While we tried to figure out what the best move was, Bugsy was already shooting. When it came to action there was no one better. I've never known a man who had more guts. Benny was also a boyhood friend of New York native and Chicago mobster Al Capone. When there was a warrant for Capone's arrest on a murder charge, Siegel allowed him to hide out with his family. Siegel was also involved in the drug trade. By age 21, he was making lots of money and flaunted it all across town, driving the fanciest cars and showing up at the grand events and clubs weekly. He was regarded as handsome with blue eyes and was known to be charismatic and liked by everyone. He bought an apartment at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel and a Tudor home in Scarsdale, New York. He wore flashy clothes and participated heavily in the nightlife of New York City. In 1929, Lansky and Siegel attended the Atlantic City Conference from May 13 to 16, representing the Bugs and Meyer gang. Luciano and former Chicago South Side gang leader Johnny Torrio held the conference at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Atlantic City, New Jersey. 
At the conference, the two men discussed the future of organized crime and the future structure of the mafia crime families. At the end of the conference, Siegel stood up and said, great, the Yids and the Dagos will no longer fight each other. On January 28, 1929, Siegel married Esther Krakauer, his childhood sweetheart and sister of contract killer Whitey Krakauer. The two would go on to have two daughters together. Siegel was said to have a reputation as a womanizer, and the marriage ended in 1946. His wife and their teenage daughters then moved to a secluded part of New York. In 1931, following the Castellamarese War and Maranzano's death, the commission was established for dividing mafia territories and preventing future wars. At this time, with his associates, Siegel formed Murder Incorporated. After he and Lansky moved on from the group, control over Murder Incorporated was ceded to Lepke Buckhalter and Albert Anastasia. Siegel continued working as a hitman from time to time, but eventually would outgrow the group unless a major incident rose that needed attention of its founders. His only conviction was in Miami. On February 28, 1932, he was arrested for gambling and vagrancy and, from a roll of bills, paid a $100 fine. During this period, Benny had a heat with associates of Waxy Gordon, known as the Fabrizio brothers. Gordon had hired the Fabrizio brothers from prison to allegedly kill Lansky and Siegel. Gordon became known as a pickpocketer and sneak thief as a child, becoming so successful, he earned the nickname Waxy for supposedly being so skilled in picking pockets. Success later led him to run all of Arnold Rothstein's bootlegging on most of the East Coast, specifically New York and New Jersey. He soon began importing large amounts of Canadian whiskey over the United States-Canadian border. Gordon was now earning an estimated $1 million a year. He began buying numerous breweries and distilleries as well as owning several speakeasies. He also began to be known to live extravagantly, traveling in limousines and living regularly in prominent Manhattan hotel suites, as well as owning mansions built for him in New York and Philadelphia, competing with Siegel throughout the city. When Rothstein died in 1928 and Gordon's position began to decline. He made an alliance with future National Crime Syndicate founders Charles Luciano, Lepke Buckhalter, and Meyer Lansky. However, he constantly fought with Meyer Lansky over bootlegging and gambling interests, and soon a gang war began between the two. This would be one of the only known head-on wars, after the commission was formed, that Murder Incorporated would participate in, as its own group. Several associates on each side were killed during this war. It was alleged that Waxy Gordon's gang was winning the war, and as a result, Lansky and Luciano supplied interim United States Attorney Thomas Dewey with information leading to Gordon's conviction on charges of tax evasion in 1933. Siegel would eventually hunt down the Fabrizio brothers, killing two of them. However, this came after their failed assassination attempt on Lansky, as well as two attempts to kill Siegel himself. After the deaths of his two brothers, Tony Fabrizio began writing memoirs and allegedly gave it to an attorney. One of the longest chapters was to be a section on the nationwide kill for hire squad led by Benny Siegel. In 1932, Siegel checked into a hospital and later that night sneaked out. He and two accomplices approached Tony Fabrizio's house and, posing as detectives to lure him outside, gunned him down. According to hospital records, Siegel's excuse to authorities for that night was that he had checked into a hospital. In 1935, Siegel assisted in Luciano's alliance with Dutch Schultz and killed their newest top rival and loan sharks, Louis and Joseph Amberg. Siegel soon learned from his associates that he was becoming too hot on the streets and being looked at by authorities. His hospital alibi had become questionable and his enemies wanted him dead. In the late 1930s, the commission sent Siegel to California. Since 1933, he had traveled to the West Coast several times, and in California, his job was to develop new gambling rackets with Los Angeles crime boss, Jack Dragna. Once in Los Angeles, Siegel recruited Jewish Los Angeles gang leader, Mickey Cohen as his chief lieutenant. Mickey Cohen, born in Brooklyn, New York, was a powerful associate of the American Mafia. Cohen would start the life of organized crime very early. In 1923, at the age of nine, he was delivering alcohol to customers from a gin mill operated by his older brother in a drug store. He was arrested later that year, but avoided prosecution due to his brother's connections. As a teenager, he moved to the West Coast to train as a professional boxer. He began boxing in illegal prize fights in Los Angeles, fighting in the Midwest on the way. His last fight was on May 14, 1933, against Baby Arizmendi in Tijuana. On June 12, 1931, Cohen fought and lost a match against world featherweight champion Tommy Paul. Having been knocked out cold within the first two minutes into the first round. During Prohibition, Cohen moved to Chicago and became involved in organized crime working as an enforcer for the Chicago outfit, where he briefly met and became friends with Al Capone. 
During this period, Cohen was arrested for his role in the deaths of several gangsters in a card game that went wrong. After a brief time in prison, Cohen was released and began running card games and other illegal gambling operations in Chicago. He later became an associate of Matthew Capone, Al's younger brother. While working for Jake Guzik, Cohen was forced to flee Chicago after a heated argument with other Chicago mobsters. In Cleveland, he would again work for Lou Rothkopf, an associate of Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel. However, there was little work available for him in Cleveland, so Rothkopf arranged for him to work with Siegel in California, where he became his lieutenant, as mentioned earlier. While in Los Angeles, Mickey was given orders by Meyer Lansky and Lou Rothkopf to work for and also keep watch upon Bugsy Siegel. During their association, Mickey helped set up the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas and ran its sports book operation. He also was instrumental in setting up the race wire, which was essential to Vegas betting, a Nevada attraction perhaps only second to the Hoover Dam. During this time, he met dancer Lavog and Weaver, and the couple married in 1940. Although business was going well, and the combination of Siegel and Cohen was working, Jack Dragna was not happy about being set aside to make room for Bugsy, even though they were bringing in way more money than ever before. However, knowing Siegel's reputation for violence and that he was backed by Lansky and Luciano, who, from prison, sent word to Dragna that it was in his best interest to cooperate with the current arrangement. Dragna allegedly accepted a subordinate role. After things settled down with Dragna, Siegel moved Esta and their daughters to California so that he would be able to visit his daughters. On tax returns, he claimed to earn his living through legal gambling at Santa Anita Park, near Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, Benny soon took over the numbers racket. He used money from the syndicate to help establish a drug trade route from the United States into Mexico. He also organized circuits with the Chicago Outfits Transamerica Wire Service, a holding company for various life insurance companies and investment firms in the United States. By 1942, $500,000 weekly was coming from the syndicate's bookmaking wire operations. In 1946, because of problems with Siegel, the Chicago outfit took over the Continental Press and gave the percentage of the racing wire to Jack Dragna, infuriating Siegel. Despite his complications with the wire services, Siegel controlled several offshore casinos and a major prostitution ring. He also maintained relationships with politicians, businessmen, attorneys, accountants, and lobbyists who fronted for him. Benny being the flamboyant mobster that he is, could not resist the temptation of Hollywood. In Hollywood, Siegel was welcomed in the highest circles and befriended stars. He was known to associate with George Raft, Clark Gable, Gary Cooper and Cary Grant, as well as studio executives Louis Mayer and Jack Warner. Actress Jean Harlow was a friend of Bugsy and godmother to his daughter Millicent. Siegel led an extravagant life, as he did in his early days in New York. He bought real estate and threw lavish parties at his Beverly Hills home. He gained admiration from young celebrities, including Tony Curtis, Phil Silvers and Frank Sinatra. Siegel had several relationships with actresses, including socialite Dorothy Di Frasso, the wife of an Italian count. The alliance with the countess took Siegel to Italy in 1938, where he met Benito Mussolini, to whom Siegel tried to sell weapons to. He continued to work with the crime syndicate to form illegal rackets. He devised a plan of extorting movie studios. He would take over local unions, specifically the Screen Extras Guild and the Los Angeles Teamsters Unions, then stage strikes to force studios to pay him off so that unions would start working again. It is alleged he borrowed money from celebrities and didn't pay them back, knowing that they would never ask him for the money. During his first year in Hollywood, he received more than $400,000 in loans from movie stars. Around November of 1939, Lepke Buckhalter, head of Murder Incorporated, gave word to Siegel to send Whitey Krakauer, Frankie Carbo and Albert Tenenbaum to kill Harry Greenberg. Greenberg had threatened to become a police informant and needed to be taken care of immediately. He was killed on November 23, 1939, outside of his apartment. Tenenbaum confessed to the murder and agreed to testify against Siegel. Siegel and Carbo were implicated to have shot and killed Greenberg, and in September 1941, Siegel was tried for the Greenberg murder. Whitey Krakauer was killed before he could face trial. The trial gained notoriety because of the preferential treatment Siegel received in jail. He refused to eat prison food and was often allowed female visitors. He was also granted leave for dental visits. Siegel would hire attorney Jerry Geisler to defend him. After the deaths of two state witnesses, no additional witnesses came forward. Tenenbaum's testimony was dismissed. In 1942, Siegel and Carbo were acquitted due to insufficient evidence, but Siegel's reputation was damaged. During the trial, newspapers revealed his past and referred to him as Bugsy. He hated the nickname, preferring to be called Ben or Mr. Siegel. On May 25, 1944, he was arrested and acquitted for bookmaking. 
Siegel wanted to be a legitimate businessman, and in 1946, he saw an opportunity with William Wilkerson's Flamingo Hotel. Las Vegas gave Siegel his second opportunity to reinvent himself. In the 1930s, he had traveled to southern Nevada with Meyer Lansky's Lieutenant Mo Sedway on Lansky's orders to explore expanding operations. There were opportunities in providing illicit services to crews constructing the Hoover Dam. Lansky had turned the desert over to Benny, but he turned it over to Mo Sedway and left for Hollywood. However, Lansky needed Benny back in Vegas and asked Siegel to watch over Wilkerson's desert development. Siegel, who knew Wilkerson lived near him in Beverly Hills and was the obvious choice as a liaison, he wanted no part in the operation that would take him back to Nevada. It meant leaving Beverly Hills and his playboy lifestyle. But at Lansky's insistence, Siegel consented. In the mid-1940s, Siegel was lining things up in Las Vegas while his lieutenants worked on a business policy to secure all gambling in Los Angeles. Throughout the spring of 1946, he proved useful when he obtained black market building materials. The post-war shortages that had dogged construction were no longer a problem. At first Siegel seemed content to do things William Wilkerson's way. However, his desire to learn about the project took precedence over his sportsman lifestyle. It subdued his aggression. Under Wilkerson's tutelage, Siegel learned the mechanics of building an enterprise. However, he began to feel intimidated and paranoid. He grew resentful of Wilkerson's vision for the desert. Tom Seward, a business partner of William Wilkerson, described Siegel as so jealous of William, it drove him crazy. He began making decisions without Wilkerson's authority, informing work crews that he had put him in charge. He ordered changes which conflicted with the blueprints. The problem came to a head when he demanded more involvement in the project. To keep the project moving, Wilkerson agreed that Benny would supervise the hotel while he retained control of everything else. In May 1946, Siegel decided the agreement had to be altered to give him control of the Flamingo. With the Flamingo, Benny would supply the gambling, the best liquor and food, and the biggest entertainers at reasonable prices. He believed these attractions would lure not only the high rollers, but thousands of vacationers willing to lose a few hundred bucks. Siegel offered to buy out Wilkerson's creative participation with corporate stock, plus an additional 5% ownership in the operation. Siegel later changed his mind. On June 20, 1946, Siegel formed the Nevada Project Corporation of California, naming himself president. He was also the largest principal stockholder in the operation, which defined everyone else merely as shareholders. William Wilkerson was eventually coerced into selling all stakes in the Flamingo under the threat of death and went into hiding in Paris for a time. From this point the Flamingo became syndicate-run. Siegel began a spending spree. He demanded the finest building that money could buy at a time of post-war shortages. Each bathroom in the 93-room hotel had its own sewer system, costing $1,150,000. More toilets were ordered than needed, costing $50,000. Because of the plumbing alterations, the boiler room was enlarged, costing $113,000. Siegel also ordered a larger kitchen that cost $29,000. Adding to the budgetary overruns, there were also problems with dishonest contractors and disgruntled unpaid builders. As costs soared, Siegel's checks began bouncing. By October 1946, the costs were above $4 million. In 1947, the Flamingo cost was over $6 million, around $62,500,000 in today's money. The first indication of trouble came in November 1946, when the syndicate issued an ultimatum. Provide accounting or forfeit funding. But producing a balance sheet was the last thing Siegel wanted to do. Siegel waged a private fundraising campaign by selling non-existent stocks, he was in a hurry so he doubled his workforce, believing the project could be completed in half the time. Siegel paid overtime. In some cases, bonuses tied to project deadlines were offered as a way to increase productivity. By late November, the work was nearly finished. According to later reports by local observers, Siegel's maniacal chest puffing set the pattern for several generations of notable casino moguls. His violent reputation didn't help his situation. After he boasted one day that he'd personally killed some men, he saw the panic look on the face of head contractor Del Webb and reassured him, Del, don't worry, we only kill each other. Under pressure for the hotel to make money, Siegel moved the opening from Wilkerson's original date of March 1, 1947, to December 26, 1946, in an attempt to generate enough money from the casino to complete the project and repay investors. However, Siegel generated confusion with the opening date. On a whim, he decided a weekend would be more likely to entice celebrities away from home. Invitations were sent out for Saturday, December 28. Siegel changed his mind again, and invitees were notified by phone that the opening had been changed back to the 26th. 
Other associates portrayed Siegel in a different aspect, as an intense character who was not without a charitable side, including his donations for the Damon Runyon Cancer Fund. Lou Wiener Jr., Siegel's Las Vegas attorney, described him as very well-liked and that he was good to people. Problems with the Trans-America Wire service had cleared up in Nevada and Arizona, but in California, Siegel refused to report business. He later announced to his colleagues that he was running operations in California by himself and that he would return the loans in his good time. Despite his defiance to the mob bosses, they were patient with Siegel because he had always proven to be a valuable man. The Flamingo opened on December 26, 1946. The casino, lounge, theater, and restaurant were finished. Although locals attended the opening, few celebrities materialized. A handful drove in from Los Angeles despite bad weather. Some celebrities present were June Haver, Vivian Blaine, George Raft, Sonny Tufts, Brian Donlevy, and Charles Coburn. They were welcomed by construction noise and a lobby draped with drop cloths. The desert's first air conditioning collapsed regularly. While gambling tables were operating, the luxury rooms that would have served as the lure for people to stay and gamble were not ready. As word of the losses made their way to Siegel during the evening, he began to become irate and verbally abusive, throwing out at least one family. After two weeks, the Flamingo's gaming tables were $275,000 in the red. The entire operation would eventually shut down in late January 1947. After being granted a second chance, Benny cracked down and did everything possible to turn the Flamingo into a success by making renovations and obtaining good press. He hired future newsman Hank Greenspun as a publicist. The hotel would reopen on March 1, 1947, with Meyer Lansky in attendance, they began turning a profit. However, by the time profits began improving, the mob bosses above Siegel were tired of waiting. Although time was running out, at age 41, Benjamin Siegel had carved out a name for himself in the histories of organized crime. And with Mickey Cohen running things on the streets from him, this duel was considered a powerhouse in the mafia world. However, on the night of June 20, 1947, as Siegel sat with his associate Alan Smiley in girlfriend's Virginia Hills Beverly Hills home, an assailant fired at him through the window, hitting him multiple times, including twice in the head. No one was charged with the murder, and the crime remains officially unsolved. It was said that the crime families ordered the murder of Siegel due to his mismanagement of the Flamingo Hotel. Most likely because Siegel or his girlfriend Virginia Hill were skimming money. Virginia Hill, an associate of the Chicago outfit, Hill was best known as a mob mistress and party hostess. During her time, she also dated mobsters Frank Costello, Frank Nitti, Tony Accardo and Joe Adonis. Also during this time, she would meet various members of the outfit under Capone's leadership. She also made numerous connections with New York City mob figures. With these associations she became a courier, or in mafia terms, a bag woman, whereas she put funds into Swiss bank accounts for such figures as Brooklyn Jewish mobster, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. It did not take long for the relationship with Siegel to become a romantic relationship. Although Hill would later deny it, through her association with Siegel, she had bought new homes for her family and lived a lavish lifestyle. According to various sources, Hill was reportedly threatened by members of the five families in the days leading up to Siegel's murder, with the instructions to hop on a plane to Chicago and to not return to California ever again. According to several accounts which does not appear in newspapers, Mickey Cohen reacted violently to Siegel's murder. Entering the Roosevelt Hotel, where he believed the killers were staying, Cohen fired rounds from his two semi-automatic handguns into the lobby ceiling as his gang proceeded to enter several hotel rooms, demanded that the assassins meet him outside. However, no one appeared and Cohen was forced to flee when the cops arrived. As the weeks continued, Cohen took full control of Bugsy Street operations in Los Angeles and continued to hunt down the mobsters sent to kill Siegel, allegedly killing one of them, which angered the commission back in New York. Cohen's violent methods came to the attention of state and federal authorities investigating Jack Dragna's operations. During this time, Mickey faced many attempts on his life, including the bombing of his home on Posh Moreno Avenue in the Brentwood section of Los Angeles. He soon converted his house into a fortress, installing floodlights, alarm systems, and a well-equipped arsenal kept, as he often joked, next to his 200 tailor-made suits. Cohen also briefly hired bodyguard Johnny Stompanato before his killing by actress Lana Turner's daughter. It is said that Cohen paid for the coffin for Stompanato's funeral and then sold Lana Turner's love letters to Stompanato to the press as a slap in the face. Mickey and his gang was also suspects in the latest of crime sprees across the state of California, which included hijackings, store robberies and bank robberies, as the gang fell on hard times after the death of Bugsy. Cohen always tried to improve himself on account of his lack of any formal education and would take vocabulary lessons. 
He almost never drank alcohol, and the cigar clenched between his teeth was rarely lit. In 1950, Mickey Cohen was investigated along with numerous other underworld figures by a U.S. Senate committee known as the Kefauver Commission. As a result of this investigation, Cohen was convicted of tax evasion and sentenced to prison for four years. When he was released, he became an international celebrity. He sold more newspapers than anyone else in the country, according to author Brad Lewis. His appearance on television with news correspondent reporter Mike Wallace in the late 1950s rocked the media establishment. During the television interview, Cohen allegedly admitted to being a killer stating, I have killed no man that, in the first place, didn't deserve killing. Here and floral shops, paint stores, nightclubs, casinos, gas stations, a men's haberdashery, and even an ice cream parlor on San Vicente Boulevard in the Brentwood section of Los Angeles. In 1961, Cohen was again convicted of tax evasion and sent to Alcatraz. His heavily armored Cadillac from this period was confiscated by the Los Angeles Police Department and is now on display at the Southward Car Museum in New Zealand. During his time on the rock, another inmate attempted to kill Cohen with a lead pipe. In 1972, Cohen was released from the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, where he had spoken out against prison abuse. Mickey Cohen lived out his last years peacefully and died in his home in 1976.